Welcome back, everyone. My name is Sam. And I'm Melissa. I grew up in the FLDS community. It is a polygamous group run by Warren Jeffs, and I moved out when I was 18 years old. I was raised LDS. Sam and I have been married for nine years and have two awesome kiddos. Yes, we do. We want to quickly thank our donors and those that are members of our channel. We really do appreciate your love and support. Yes, today is the final episode of Daughters of the Cult, talking about the LeBaron group. This is episode five, and if you haven't seen our other episodes, then you can click the link above and start from the beginning. And this has been a wild ride for these past five episodes. Mm. Oh my word. But this is kind of the end of it, and so much is coming to a head. Episode four ended with the four o'clock murders about to happen. And basically episode five was all about these four o'clock murders. Right. So there were a couple things that were instantly very intriguing about these murders. One, they all, basically they had three people on the hit list from the book of the new covenant, right? And the kingdom of God or the KOG had come up into the United States from Mexico and they are fulfilling and basically doing this hit list that Ervil LeBaron had written down right. in the Book of the New Covenant. And Eddie Marston, Mark Shanoth, and Dwayne Shanoth were the next people on this list. And they decided that they were going to wear matching disguises, matching stolen pickup trucks for all three murders at the same time. There actually ended up being four murders. Yeah, they planned it for two years. It was very well thought out. At first, I was wondering why they would be dressed the same and why they would do that. But, but you find out in the trial. They Exactly. It was all to make it so difficult for the law enforcement to come after them. Yes. I thought it was also so interesting and kind of crazy that they decided to do this on June 27th at 4 p.m., which is when yep. Joseph Smith was killed at Carthage Jail. And Joseph Smith is the founding prophet of all Mormonism, all the different Mormonism branches and fundamental Mormonism. So when they mentioned that, I was like, oh my gosh, like the amount of thought that they put into every tiny detail of these murders. And it went off without a hitch. I mean, the well, the hitch was they were successful at the murders. One of the men did have their daughter, Jenny, there, Dwayne, I believe. Mm -hmm. And so the guy saw that the little girl was screaming because she had just watched her father be killed. And he went and shot her at point blank as well. The amount of... To even kill a person to begin with, the mental space to be able to do that. Yeah. And then on top of that, to be able to do it so quickly and without thinking to a child mm -hmm. made me sick. Yeah. I don't, I don't understand it. I don't understand how people can do it. I know that they were claiming they were doing it for, for God or for their prophet, whatever. Mm. It, just, it just is so mind-blowing to me. I mean, I came from a very, very high-demand, strict religion as well that I, I, I thought at the time I would do anything for the prophet or for God, as I thought. But I don't know. If Warren Jeffs had come to me and said, hey, God wants you to go kill so-and-so. I don't think I could have done it. I think the difference for Kingdom of God was the fact that they had been raised around violence their whole lives. Mm. So I think they were kind of immune to the violence factor because Ervil was their father. They had been in Mexico. They had been in raids. They had been killing other members from other sects. And then their training as a militia to get ready to do that, I think that had to have played a bigger part into how they would be capable of something like that. For sure. And not to mention that Ervil LeBaron, who was the mastermind, the evil, evil <laughs> master, ma mastermind behind all of this stuff, he was very detailed on how they were supposed to do it. But not only that, he was very good at using scripture, which this kind of reminds me of Warren Jeffs, using scripture to justify doing certain things. Like mm -hmm. he would use examples of when God commanded people to be killed in scripture and say, see, this is, as, you know, this is as old as time. This is what God asks his people to do sometimes because so-and-so isn't, isn't supposed to be on this earth anymore. Yeah. And so, yeah, it was a definitely a very well thought out, but also justified by scripture according to Ervil LeBaron. And at this point, so much of the Shanoth family had been kind of on their own trying to leave like all the LeBaron stuff in the past pretty much, right? Um, Celia and Anna were both living with Mark Shanoth, taking care of their children, like dealing with all of this and trying to like start normal lives mm. that 
I think they were probably all very caught off guard. It seemed like they were. They're talking about the fact that like at 13, it happens. And now every time someone knocks on the door, they're 13 year olds having to stick a gun out the window. And they're told if you see your sibling, because these are all, they're all related, like closely related. If you see a sibling with a gun, shoot them. Can you imagine if you haven't been trained? Like Anna is being told this. She hasn't been trained since birth to kill people because she had been in the United States for a long time at this point. The idea of if you see your sibling and they have a gun, shoot them and kill them is crazy. But they knew that Lillian was on the list. Their mother in Denver was on the list. There were more people that were on this hit list that they needed to be worried about. And because of the fact, and I didn't know this either, they said in the trial, they they had an idea of who it was. They didn't have any proof. And they were just trying, grasping at straws for anything. And they ended up Well, I guess I have to take a step back before we say why the disguises were important. But, you know, they put the Shanath family in witness protection. They're dealing with snipers at the funeral because they're worried that the All Red, you know, it's going to be the same as Rulin All Red's Mm -hmm. funeral, where the funeral is just another way to bring everybody out that's on the list so that you can destroy and kill more people. So everybody's on high alert and all of that. But Heber, Doug, and Richard got caught in Phoenix. And this is just a testament to, you know, we say all the time, like, if you see something suspicious, call, or why is it so good to have people looking for, like, the missing children in the FLDS? Or why is it good for there just to be general knowledge in communities out there in America? This is a good example of somebody calling in something that looks suspicious, the cops coming, and they found all this circumstantial evidence in the trucks that these boys, Heber, Doug, and Richard, had been a part of these murders clear in Texas. Right. All just because somebody was willing to call in something that looks suspicious. Yeah. And so they bring them and they get grand theft auto charges for the stolen trucks, but they still can't pin them down because they said in our law system, if there was these three murders, you have to pin which person pulled the trigger in which case. And since they were all wearing the exact same thing, looked the same, drove the same truck, nobody could identify who had done which murder, Yeah, which blew the whole thing apart. And they couldn't actually prosecute any of the three boys, even though they had the three boys, they know that it was them, but because they can't identify who did what, it was all gone. Which just goes to show you how well thought out it was. I mean, they would, yeah. have, they would have had to know that part of the law to know, you know what, they won't be able to have anything on us because they won't be able to just or prove who did what. And so they were very, very, I don't know, was it not Heber? Who was the one in, Aaron? Aaron. Was it Aaron that had the, planned all this out? Or do you yeah, think Aaron Ir- Irvil LeBaron wrote it down? Um, I think Aaron planned it out. Okay. Yeah, I think Irvil had the list, right, of who they were supposed to do this to. But Aaron seemed to be the mastermind. Mm. And yeah, they just had nothing to go on, basically. They talked about how hard it was for the family. Like, Anna had to change her last name in order to go to college because they were like, we other parents are going to take their kids out. They're worried that you're a danger. The whole family is just having to deal with the repercussions of being a part of such a violent family, which is so sad because it's not the children's fault. No. Right? You can't help what you're born into. And they're dealing with that. It broke my heart when they said that like Lillian took her own life. And Mm. I think at the end they said that there were a total of nine deaths by suicide within the family. People who thought that they were going to be next on the hit list or the son who put Ervil away. You know, I think his name was Isaac. Yeah. yeah. He he ended up... Yeah, we were wondering what happened to him. Yeah, the torment yeah. just continued. Like, they couldn't get away from it. Yeah. You, you have to also... I mean, we, we, all, we often say when people are born into a situation, you know, a lot of what they do isn't necessarily their fault because they were raised a certain way to believe a certain thing, and this is all they know, which to some extent is true. But you also, when this is a, this is kind of an eye-opening thing to me though, when you have people like Heber and Aaron, those two boys showed an example of what they could have done and what they chose to do in the sense that Heber was just a murderer. He would, he would just kill people because it's almost like he enjoyed it. And then Aaron stepped in and went back to the ways of his father and bef- and er- Heber hadn't done this but Aaron chose to pick up the book 
this that that had the hit list in it mm -hmm. and carry it out so there were still all of these decisions even though they were born and raised in this there were all of these decisions that were 100 percent their fault they chose to do these awful things when they had other choices that they could have made instead and obviously and i know there's a lot of times people will say like there's little aha moments too for people right mm -hmm. like even if you're very indoctrinated brainwashed whatever you want to call it there's still those moments where you go that's too far you know within the fls there'll be mothers who say okay wait this is getting dangerous for my children and then there are people who don't and they don't have that line till something down the road right so it's hard to know when someone's aha moment's going to be in this case they were lucky that Cynthia from Kingdom of God, mm. she had one of those moments where she was like, this is getting too dangerous for me and my sister. She called the Utah authorities and she knew all the details. She's the one that and brought them all down. She did. She single-handedly. So she had that moment of realization like this is too far, even though she had been raised in it the same as Aaron and Heber. She had been following them. She had been following everything she'd been taught her whole life. But she said, okay, like this is too much. And she got immunity and said... I know a lot of stuff and I'm definitely part of this, but if you give me immunity, I will give you everything. And she was able to give them Dan's murder. She was able to give them down to the T everything about the four o'clock murders and all this stuff. And the guys who were already in jail, Heber, Doug, and Richard, you know, they brought them from jail and put them on trial and they were found guilty. And Cynthia testified. She stood yeah. there and actually like said it in front of them to their faces, like no fear. Or they said it, it seemed, seemed like that she way, wasn't. Yeah. And Heber and Doug were prisoned for life. Richard took a plea deal for five years. Um, he was a minor, so they said everything was a little bit different for him. But ultimately, she helped get all the bad guys. But if it wasn't for her standing up for what was right and saying enough is enough, they would have gotten away with the perfect murder. Yeah. Murders. Right, exactly. And so this also goes to show a good example of someone that the natural instinct comes out and says, you know what? Yes, this is the way I was raised. This is what I was taught. But my natural instinct says killing people is not good. Mm -hmm. And I don't like this. And so I'm going to turn my brothers in. And so that's just another example that just because you're raised a certain way, and I have my personal example, too, of stepping outside of the uh, outside of the bubble. And, you know, those are just some moments where there's a there's still hope. There's hope that someone within these high demand groups, some of these really dangerous high demand groups will eventually stand up and say, no, I'm not I'm not going to allow this. I'm not going to do this type of thing anymore. Yeah. And then two years later, they were able to catch Aaron. The Mexican government decided that they were going to try harder to pursue this. They're seeing the danger that's being caused by the KOG. They get Aaron, they extradite him, and he spends 45 years in prison for orchestrating the killings. So, I mean, overall, it was just crazy to see where it's ending in that portion of it, I guess, as the religion goes. And they did talk about just kind of wrapping things up where the family, now everybody disavows Ervil LeBaron. Mm -hmm. And they're still dealing with repercussions. Even in 2019, mm -hmm. LeBaron's in Mexico, they got caught. Um, women and children, three cars were ambushed with only mothers and children in it. And the cartel mistakenly shot these three cars of mothers and children, and which is just horrific. And so this poor LeBaron family is just constantly going through all of these cycles of violence and hopefully now they'll be able to start having some peace they said that now there's currently 7,000 LeBarons and they're one of the largest families in the Americas and again they all disavow everything that Ervil said and they said two quotes that I was like okay it's really interesting when you take away the brainwashing they were always good people mm. and this kind of goes like to what you were saying like there's that line of where brainwashing ends and people are making those decisions on their own, which will, you know, how many of them were good people just doing the best that they can, just like all of these groups that we cover. Most of the people are good people doing the best they can. And then you always have those leaders who are going to abuse Ervil, Heber, Aaron, Dan, you know, but they end up being the people who are in those leadership positions that are abusing and taking advantage 
of the people, whether it's children for their labor, whether it's underage marriages, whether it's arranged marriages, it's just whether it's physical abuse, all these type of things, it tends to be a lot of good people who are being taken advantage of by those few evil men. Yeah. And it's proof that it's, that there are just some bad people and some good people, because even within these groups, there are those that are in leadership rules that don't do some of these awful things. And then an, another leader comes in and starts all of this awful stuff. And so it, it goes to show that even some that are put into leadership positions aren't always bad people. Mm -hmm. Like Mark Shanoth. For, did I say that last yeah. name right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like Mark Shanoth, for example, everyone loved him and said he was a great guy, even though he was one of the high up people in the church. I mean, he would have to be to be on the hit list. And it seemed like he was really good to his family, really good to those relatives. Uh, I'm not sure if he was involved in some of the killing. It seemed like he would have had to have at least some kind of knowledge but it seemed like overall, if it wasn't, like you just said, if it wasn't for the brainwashing, he was a great guy. Yeah. So it's interesting to see all those. I thought it was funny that at the end they made them watch The Prophet of Evil, the 90s movie that mm. was all about this, that was made in the 90s. And I was like, man, we need to find that video. If you guys want us to do a reaction video to the old 90s movie, because at this point, now that we've seen the documentary style, hearing it directly from the people, I'm very curious how closely, like if it's dramatized or if it really is a pretty accurate movie. Um, but if you want us to react to that, leave it in the comments. <laughs> that pretty much sums it up. The Daughters of the Cult series comes to an end with episode five, and I feel like they pretty well summed it all up and brought it to an end saying there is no more, or at least <laughs> hopefully there are no more follower, followers or believers in Ervil LeBaron. Yeah. That is far from, they are far from his teachings now. But they did point out that as long as that hit list book is out there, there's always the chance. There's always the chance that someone picks it up and wants to continue on. And so we're just really hoping that that never happens. Or at this point, I don't know if any, if people on that hit list are still alive. I don't know. But also, something that's important to remember is that's another reason why it's good for these documentaries to come out right because now there are more and more people who understand the harm that it created the murders the amount of people that died from this and if someone hears or sees that book hopefully they'll be running the other way because they have the knowledge to know what it's about before getting sucked into something that could become a cult in the future so that's yeah. another reason why education on these older groups are important because that way it's less likely for people to pull it out of the closet and say oh this is what right. we should be doing exactly so, so thank you all so much for being here with us throughout this whole series of daughters of the cult i hope you enjoyed it and we really appreciate you going along this journey with us yes if you want to hear more of what it was like for sam to grow up in polygamy please like and subscribe and we'll talk to y'all soon we'll talk to y'all soon <laughs>